Canary by Cloud Nine and Three Quarters. Chapter 34 The Action Plan. Siren's human was missing. There was something wrong with the air when Siren collapsed. When she awoke, it was gone. She thought that would be the end of that story, but that was not to be. Her human's mum came and picked her up from the strange place she'd found herself in, with white walls and shiny metal cages. She was quite happy to be back with that human. She had to be on her list of top ten humans. But she seemed... sad, which wasn't good at all. Siren tried to cheer her up with her singing, which usually helped, but it just seemed to make her face leak more water, which couldn't have been a good thing. She took Siren home, and Siren was quick to fly across the house to her room. Her human lived there, too, because she was kind enough to share it with him. But it was dark inside. That wasn't right. The miniature sun should be a light in the middle of the room, unless her human was sleeping. She pecked at the white thing, which made it day inside again, but her human didn't seem to be asleep at all. In fact, his nest was empty, and his bags were all on it. Untouched. Siren perched by her nest. Maybe her human was hiding. <laughs> How silly of him. So she hopped over to her bell and pecked at it. It made a very satisfying ringing noise that often succeeded in making her human wake up or come and check on her. However, after persistent ringing for far longer than usual, only the mum human appeared at the doorway. Siren stopped, cocking her head to one side as she tweeted at her in confusion. She sniffed. He's gone, Siren. Siren turned her head from the empty room and back to mum human. She tripped at her again. This didn't make sense. Her human wasn't allowed to go anywhere without her. Where did he go? The villains took him away, she sobbed, falling to her knees. And we don't know if he'll ever come back. Siren sat there for a moment. No, this wasn't right, not at all. Her human was in danger? Then why wasn't she with him? She took one glance at the open window and took off. She had to find him. But... She couldn't. The little green bird flew as far as her wings could carry her. She visited UA, the radio show, the beach, the dance studio, everywhere across the city that her human could possibly have gone to. But he was nowhere to be found. She was tired. She was hungry. She flew home, and Mum human cried again when she saw her. But Siren didn't have the heart to sing to cheer her up. Siren didn't have enough cheer to go around. Mom human took Siren back to the place with the white walls. She didn't know why. Maybe it was because she wasn't singing anymore. But she wasn't sick, and she wasn't mute either. Siren could sing if she wanted to. But it was just so much easier to fade into the background. To not make a fuss or make things worse. That was what female canaries were supposed to do. They were quiet. Siren was with her human's friend now. The purple one. He was sad, too. She could tell. But Siren was a little happier now she was with him. She was in the know. She'd met all of her humans, humans, and was still working on the names for a lot of them. She had spent the last few days in a new place for the humans at school. They had all their nests close to each other, which was nice to see. And they all said hello to her a lot and gave her lots of food. She wasn't in the mood to eat much of it. But she appreciated the gesture. They were struggling to settle in, though. Siren's second favorite human, the tired purple one, had rightfully shouted lots at the angry human that Siren didn't like. But now everyone was even sadder and seemed to be rather confused as to who to talk to and who to comfort. It was a big mess of emotions and Siren wasn't too sure how to help. However, Siren's second favorite human was now spending a lot of time with the other purple human. You see her problem here? It's awfully difficult to differentiate between the two when they're both purple. The girl one. They were both sad, but they were slightly less so when they were able to do it together. But Siren was quite proud of them, like they were her new chicks, because they'd finally figured out a way to stop huddling together in their nest being sad 
and learn how to fly and fix this problem themselves in the best way they could. There was even a soft smile on their faces as they were escorted out of UA and towards the train station, and Siren couldn't wait to see what happened next. But if there was ever the slightest chance Siren could sink her talons into the skull of whoever did this to her human, she would! Fourteen days since the kidnapping. Jiro had been rather shocked when Shinzo offered her the chance to feature alongside him on the radio that following week. She had been trying to get her head around what special moves she could possibly accomplish before the upcoming provisional licensing exam when he asked her. This was a welcome break. If her mind wasn't set on a task, it just drifted back to Canary. So she had been keeping herself busy. Too busy. Even Momo had said she needed to take some time off or something. Yes, going to the radio station would take her grieving mind once again back to her missing friend. But she felt less hopeless this time. Shinzo had pointed out something to her. There was a good chance Canary would be able to hear them. See you guys later, Jiro waved to the others gathered in the common room. We're going to keep the radio on, Mina called enthusiastically. How fun! But before she walked out the door, she hesitated, catching Bakugo's gaze. He sat on his phone in the corner of the room, earphones in. Jiro wasn't sure what to think of him anymore. Before, she'd seen him as a guy with a personality explosive as his quirk, someone who didn't really know how to interact with others or deal with friends. He was powerful and had an admirable drive, all of which were still true. But now she could see another side to him, something which had been plain as day, yet so hard to see. Jiro didn't know if it was something he was ashamed of, something he regretted, or if he'd get to come to terms with what he had done to Canary, what that meant to him. Right now, there was just too much going on in Jiro's head to add that mess to the mix. So she kept her distance, siding with Shinzo, who seemed to hate the guy more than Jiro thought it was possible to hate someone who wasn't actually a villain. Or maybe that was the point. Shinzo was quiet on the train to the radio station, so Jiro was too. She turned back to her phone, which was on her social media account, growing in popularity as time went by. Aozora, who seemed to be the one who held the whole radio show business together single-handedly, had been in contact with Jiro over the last few days. The blue-skinned woman had video called her after class and given her a crash course on how to improve her social media presence. Somehow, the conversation had morphed into one concerning the difficulties of getting makeup for someone with a rather blue complexion. Aozora was nice to talk to. She just had a way with making your worries disappear and was a brilliant distraction from Jiro's troubles. She must have been a real lifesaver for Canary, and Jiro looked forward to actually meeting her. Here we are, Shinso sighed as he pushed open the glass door to the radio station. It was completely blacked out from the outside, but as they walked in, she could see that it wasn't the case from the inside, where the entire wall appeared to be completely ordinary glass. There were two receptionists sitting by a long desk at the far end of the empty entrance hall. Hey, Raven! The guy called out. Nice to see you again! You too, Shinso said in reply as he leant against the desk. I can't remember. We need to sign in, right? It's okay, I've got you covered. The girl receptionist nodded. Who's your friend? Oh, I'm Jiro. She introduced herself. Owl! Wait, you're Owl? The guy questioned, leaning forward so he was uncomfortably close to her face. He narrowed his eyes and scrutinized her strangely for a second. Nice to meet you! He then announced, falling back into his chair again with a smile. Uh, you too, I guess? Jiro said with a raised eyebrow. Shinzo rolled his eyes. Ignore him, everyone here is crazy. This is true. The girl nodded. Oh, by the way, Ozora said to give you this. Across the table, the woman slipped an obnoxiously bright orange card. Shinzo frowned as he picked it up and then blinked when he saw the name Raven written across it. Is this a... A key card to the building, yep, she nodded. I'm not sure if you have as much access as Canary. My suggestion would be to just click every single button on the elevator and see where it actually lets you go. Siren seemed incredibly intrigued by the card. Maybe she thought it was Canary's at first because she hopped down from Shinso's shoulder and onto his wrist to stare at it a little closer for a moment before appearing visibly dejected and flying back up to her usual perch. 
I'll bear that in mind. Shinso nodded. And so, after signing a piece of paper that could very much have just sold her soul, because Jiro didn't bother reading it, Shinzo led her towards the elevator, used his new card to grant him access, and took her all the way up to the 13th floor. There they are! Called out Aozora with a smile that was not nearly as creepy as Jiro knew it could be from Shinzo's descriptions. How are you, my little hero fledglings? Could be worse, was Shinzo's reply. That's the spirit! Aozora said cheerfully, and it's lovely to meet you properly, Ow! She grinned. Jiro smiled the best she could in return, holding out a hand for her to shake. But Aozora ignored it and threw herself into a hug with the smaller girl. If you ever need to talk again, you just give me a call, okay? She whispered loud enough for Jiro to hear with her quirk. Jiro swallowed the lump in her throat as she hugged her back. No! Aozora sighed as she let Jiro go. I asked you guys to come half an hour early for a good reason. You didn't have the key card to get in through the back door, and I didn't want you to have to deal with the press swarming around outside the front because they know the owls making your first appearance. She explained. They've started to come down over the last week now that they've had their fill of swarming us to see if they can get even the littlest snippet of information about Canary's disappearance. Anyway, make yourself an out. She indicated to the collection of sofas around them in the waiting room outside of the main studio, seemingly hidden behind the blinds covering a thick soundproof window along the far wall. They did a good job. Jiro couldn't hear anything at all from President Mike, who must have been still chatting away to his invisible audience back there. Shinzo didn't wait a moment before collapsing into one of the larger sofas in the corner of the room, the one underneath the open window to the dimming world outside. Jiro faltered before perching beside him. She followed his gaze to the nearby armchair completely covered in unused cushions and blankets. That's the canary's nest. Shinso explained with a slight grin. Jiro looked back and, like she had suddenly learnt teleportation, Siren was sitting in the middle of the chair. The sight of the tiny creature in amongst the overwhelming pile of cushions made Jiro smile too. A few minutes passed where no one said anything at all. Jiro was convinced Siren had fallen asleep and perhaps that Shinso had followed suit. Jiro just stared at the animated silhouette of President Mike behind those blinds inside the actual radio studio. Aozora was the one who broke that silence. So, Owl! She began getting up from her chosen sofa to plonk herself down next to Jiro. How's life at the dorms? All Raven would give me was that it was interesting. Jiro scoffed. Yeah, that's certainly a word I would use to describe it. Come on, then! Aozora said, nudging her with her elbow gently. Give me some details! I do like to know the gossip and I have a feeling you're the same. With my quirk, that's not really something I can avoid. Jiro replied, twirling one of her earphone jacks around her finger. But yeah, uh, well, I guess there's a lot of tensions at the moment. You could say that again, Shinzo moaned. So, he was awake. You were the one who started it! Jiro acknowledged, shaking her head in disbelief. Nah, I just made it worse. What do you make worse? Aozora pressed. Jiro and Shinzo exchanged glances, and then both replied at exactly the same time. Bakugo. The explosion, kid! Aozora confirmed, raising an eyebrow. The very same! Jiro nodded. She continued after a deep sigh. He and Canary have a history, as it turns out. And Shinzo decided to bring it into the limelight, and everyone kind of had a breakdown over it. And now no one's getting along with anyone. Aozora bounded on Jiro what to say. Yeah, that does make for an interesting dynamic. Jiro nodded. Shinzo didn't bother saying anything at all. I went by further, Aozora wisely decided. So what were we talking about last night before I had to go? Blue makeup? No, after that. Oh, can I use ice and all? It. Aozora grinned, snapping her fingers. Did you ever get a copy from Raven? Not since last night. Tell me how first. Shinso groaned as he slumped over the arm of the sofa. Let me try. Aozora offered. Give me your phones. I don't trust you with my phone, Shinso said. Aozora gasped in mock offense. Run! Aozora had this incredible talent to make others smile. It was strange, considering how unsettling her own could be at times. 
She was just so easy to talk to. You could slip into a conversation with her on almost anything, and she could make it run through the time like the two of you were old friends. Hero's worry simply washed away, left forgotten in the back of her mind as they continued to babble on about utter nonsense. Right up until the time when President Mike threw open the door to his radio studio and invited them inside. Jiro hadn't seen President Mike much since the summer camp, not even since school started up again. He seemed like his usual self at first glance. Outrageous hair, a shockingly loud voice, and a brilliant white smile. But look a little closer, and Jiro could see through that mask of his. He was putting on a show, like he always did, being happy and smiley, playing the character of present Mike, rather than himself, and the real him, he was probably feeling as bad as them. But he was keeping busy like Jiro had been, keep moving forwards and hope that everything would turn out okay. The problem was, this wasn't exactly a puzzle with a clear solution to work towards. There was nothing they could realistically do to get Canary back safe. Except maybe this. Put your hands up for you! Thursday, 1830. Present Mike's radio show. Present Mike. Good evening, my lovely listeners. How are we all today? Good? Good. Now let me introduce you to our not one, but two comments for the rest of today. You all know Ribbon. Ribbon. Hey. Present Mike. And someone else you all know, but this is the very first time on the show. Welcome, Owl. Owl. Hi. Thank you for having me. Is it Mike? No, thank you! Raven and Owl are both Hero Course students from UA! How's it been so far? Owl. The course itself? Pretty great. I've made tons of new friends, not including Raven, of course. Raven. Thanks. Owl. And the teachers are really great, too. Raven. Except for our English teacher. Owl. Yeah, that guy's annoying. A moment of silence. Present Mike. It should be illegal to have the two of you in the same room! Your combined status is criminal! That was so uncalled for! Raven. Which is precisely why it had to be done. Present Mike. Well then! Go on, Raven! You only recently transferred to Owl's class! Owl's live in the new dorms! Raven. Interesting. Owl. Why is that always your go-to word to describe this? Raven. We literally just had this conversation. Owl. There are other words! Raven. Alright then, the hero course itself is kind of hardcore for someone as far behind as I am. It's really exactly what I need at the moment. The dorm life, however, makes for... How did we describe it earlier? Oh yeah. An interesting dynamic. Owl. That's just because you're a loner who refuses to make any friends! Raven. Yeah, true. President Mike. But you have each other! Raven. No, she has too many emotions and is far too nosy. Owl. He's about influence. He drinks death syrup at midnight! Raven. Coffee. Owl. First of all, I don't know what it is, but it definitely isn't coffee! And secondly, at midnight! Raven. My point stands. You are nosy. Owl. You're an eyesore! Raven. Thanks. Present Mike. Is your entire friendship just built on sarcasm? Raven? Yep. Owl. Absolutely. Present Mike hesitates. Present Mike. No one can tell if they're being sarcastic or not. Anyways! Owl. Doesn't Canary give us a random fact at this point in the show or something? Raven. I am not that knowledgeable. Owl. Yeah, I know. But you spend more time with him, so surely something's been in green there. Or is it that blank? Raven. That was a pun, wasn't it? Owl. I have no idea what you're talking about. Present Mike. Go on! Give us a random fact then! Raven. I can give you a debatable fact. Present Mike. Fire away! Raven. Owls are good singers. Faint scuffling can be heard. Owl. Why is that a debatable fact? Raven. Debatable. Owl. No, no, you're saying it wrong. Debatable. President Mike. 
We're gonna help Dragon! Why is it to be to ball? A brief moment of silence. Where's the mic? I didn't mean to say it like that! What have you done? Raven. God's work. Owl. Moving on! Raven. She saw with Canary at the summer camp and it was really good. Owl. No! No, it wasn't! We do not speak of this! Raven. Now everyone bombard her social media and ask her to sing. Owl. Do not do that! Raven. Someone is being louder than Cockatoo. I never thought I'd live to see the day. Was it like, speaking of music? Raven. You did that on purpose. Was it like, why don't we play a song? Raven. I have regrets. Was it like, sing it after this? Shit, so! Jiro cried, flushing red and aiming an earphone jack at him. He ducked and rolled off his chair, now using it as a shield. I have regrets, he repeated. Damn right you do! She exclaimed furiously. What did you say that for? Because you should sing. Shinzo explained, sitting back on his chair and finally taking off his headphones. Like Canary used to do. Jiro blinked, the red fading from her face as she hesitated. Aozora told me that she thought one of the reasons why you wanted to come on here was because you thought Canary might be able to hear you! President Mike interjected solemnly. The two looked over to him. His smile had faded from that fake one he wore, stretching from ear to ear despite the circumstance. The one he sported now was just soft and perhaps sympathetic, admiring their determination to help their friend. I've been considering that possibility too! He continued, tapping at the muted microphone before him. If you want to sing, you're more than welcome to! Jiro bit her lip. Sing? On the radio? Was she really good enough to do something like that? She glanced around the room. Shinzo and President Mike had been woefully serious, and it wasn't like Shinzo to be serious around her. She knew he wasn't being sarcastic for once. But then her gaze fell to the blue-skinned woman leaning against the open door to the radio studio. Jiro's wobbly smile grew wider, and she nodded towards Aozora. Now Jiro understood what Shinzo meant about her smile being so creepy. She nodded back to her. Then let's do this! Out of all the places he'd been dragged over those past few weeks, this had to be the worst. The lower half of his face was wrapped in bandages covered loosely by a cheap black surgical mask. Despite that, he often found himself coughing on the dust in the air. At least it was better than the mask he'd made out of a birdseed bag back at the summer camp. Yes, this was Midoriya. He was still here, still alive, still waiting. He'd been counting the days, and since night had now fallen, indicated by how much light poured in through the little windows high in the top of the warehouse and the gaping holes in the battered ceiling, it had now been almost exactly 14 days since his capture. Eleven since he last saw his friends, but not since he last heard them. It was cold for a late summer's night. He wrapped his arms around himself. At least the villains had been courteous enough to grant him this old worn hoodie, colored in present gray. The sounds of his friends on the radio were warming enough, though. He grimaced and tried again. He couldn't make the L sound properly this time. It was frustrating. Who'd have thought trying to say the word debatable would be so difficult? Some words were certainly easier than others, but he was working on it. If he ever got out of here, he'd work on some proper speech therapy, that was for sure. The main issue surrounding the whole getting out predicament was Kirogiri, the warp gate villain. He managed to break out a total of five times if he didn't include the Kamino attack, and for four of them, he'd walk straight into a portal that appeared out of nowhere taking him right back to where he'd started. What sickened him the most was the third time he'd escaped, just before they left for this warehouse. That was the one time where Kirogiri wasn't involved. Midoriya had managed to get all the way to a police station. He was just about to step inside when Shigaraki appeared, looped an arm around his shoulders, and marched him away. Midoriya knew he was perfectly happy to disintegrate him right there on the spot, so yelling for help wouldn't have done anything good for him. Shigaraki could have gone after any of the passers-by just for the hell of it after he was finished with Midoriya and could still have disappeared before anyone 
just out of sight in the police station, could have leapt into action. Out of all the villains there, he hated Shigaraki the most. Despite being a real pain, Kurogiri wasn't actually that bad. Toga had to be second on Midoriya's list, with Spinner as the third. Mainly because Toga liked him way more than any of the others, and Spinner despised him with a burning passion. Probably because it was Midoriya's fault, Stain had been arrested. A lot of the villains there seemed to be devoted followers of Stain's ideals, despite Midoriya knowing that Stain was never part of the League. And Shigaraki wasn't that fond of the man himself anyway. It wasn't like Midoriya could tell them that, though. Stop making those pathetic noises, would you? Groaned Magne as she leant against what Midoriya was quite sure was a rather large magnet hidden under a grain cloth. Midoriya glared at her from across the room. At least it wasn't Dabi. He was always far less tolerant. The Scarred Man was also an admirer of Stain, but for some reason didn't hate Midoriya for it. Or maybe he did, he just couldn't be bothered to show it. He was an odd character. Midoriya found it hard to read him. He was certainly frightening. Midoriya knew he would kill without much thought. He seemed to enjoy it. In fact... But he was good with caring for Midoriya's injuries, skilled with the bandages, which made sense considering all his visible scars. What didn't make sense to Midoriya was why they kept him here. For the first week, they'd been persistent in their attempts to make Midoriya join their number, give up his ambition for heroics. But eventually, they had realized that there was no hope. Midoriya's ideals would not budge. What was the point? He understood the whole taking his voice thing in some horrific, sadistic kind of way. But he felt like they really were keeping him like some kind of pet at this point like a trophy. He would ask them the point of it all, but he couldn't, which was as frustrating as anything. Head up, Canary, said Gombrus, fiddling with his mask as he stepped into view behind Shigaraki. Midoriya just shrunk away instead, leaning up against the dust-covered metal crate that one of his wrists was stubbornly chained to. The villains were gathering. He didn't know what was going on, but it must have been important because Toga turned off the radio as she skipped towards him, cutting off the upbeat song and filling the warehouse with an echoing silence. It was broken moments later with the noise of the door screeching open. Twice was there, and alongside him, a stranger wearing a mask that could have been taken from a plague doctor. Well now, you might have been been catch hot twice! leered Shigaraki, who had leant against the wall not far from Midoriya as Toga slid down to sit beside him. He didn't bother shuffling away. You think so? The stranger replied, his voice revealing that he was eerily comfortable in this environment. Strange coming from you, the League of Villains. He glanced across the warehouse, zeroing in on Midoriya within a few seconds. His eyes narrowed. Here's the young head of the Shie Hasekai what you would call Yakuza. Shigaraki explained to his goons. Midoriya supposed he was one of them, if not unintentionally. But he didn't like the look of this guy. At least he knew these villains. And Dabi wasn't around an enigma as always. Spinner was nowhere to be seen either. Togo wasn't acting as overly enthusiastic as usual, which was a nice change. She insisted on being close to Midoriya, though, whilst Compress sat on the crate above them, explaining to her, and Midoriya too, presumably, what this guy stood for, and what that meant for them. Yakuza, Yakuza are frankly obsolete, Compress sighed in conclusion, an endangered species. I suppose that's true, the stranger agreed. But I don't seem to be the only one who's an endangered species around here. Midoriya dared to hold his gaze as the other villains slowly turned to him. Alongside the fall of All Might and All for One, all the media talks about is Canary, he continued. I thought you'd killed him. We still have uses for him, Shigaraki explained. Midoriya just growled. He didn't wilt under Shigaraki's hard stare at this time and just glared back defiantly. But do have an actual plan. 
Shigaraki pushed away from the wall, pulling his real hands from his pockets with the hint of a threat. Watch your tongue! He glanced back at Midoriya. And your tone! Don't want to end up like Canary! You took away his voice! The stranger realized, immediately connecting the dots without much effort at all. Now what? Let him go? What other purpose could you possibly have? There's no way he'll join you. Surely you've realized that. He sighed, pulling at the thin white gloves that covered his own hands. You have goals, but they're simply wishes without a clear way to actually act them out. I have a plan, Shigaraki leered. I will turn this hero society to dust, and it starts with Kaderi. He may not join us, but we have ways of making the world think that he has. Midoriya's eyes widened. What did he mean by that? And then what? The beaked man scoffed, taking a few steps closer to them. Will the world simply fall at your feet? No, it won't. Meanwhile, my plan is guaranteed to make a stir. Follow me. Make me a new leader, and I'll show you a path to that wish of yours. I thought you came here to join us, said Shigaraki through gritted teeth. Twice you brought him here without even knowing what he wanted. As Twice took a couple steps back in a slight panic, the brave villain continued with his argument. You may have been all for one so-called successor, but you won't do well to follow in his footsteps, become the leader of the shadows. But you have no idea how to even be one. You had the hero killer staying by your side, muscular too, both of which were taken down by that little kid right there. Midoriya gulped, his heart beating fast and hard against his ribcage as the man pointed in his direction. You couldn't manage a few crazy people, and all you got in return was the broken husk of a wannabe hero. Something snapped in Midoriya. He clambered to his feet, quickly pulling at the chain that held him in place, his fists balled in anger. I'm not dead yet, was what he would have said. The stranger let out a small laugh. Not quite given up yet. That's good. What do you want? Shigaraki snapped, not tearing his eyes away from the intruder. In order to execute my design, I need money, he explained without hesitation. Unfortunately, there aren't many people out there willing to invest in some obsolete small-time yakuza. But your group, on the other hand, has widespread name recognition. Join me? And I'll make it worth your while. I'll show you exactly how to use what you have to make your wishes a reality. A moment of silence passed as Toga got to her feet beside Midoriya. He could feel the tension in the air. Lame, was all Shigaraki stated before one of his followers leapt into action. Magne pulled that cloth off her support item as she charged towards him. We didn't band together to serve under somebody like you, she cried, yelling out what this group meant to her as she used her quirk to pull the stranger towards her, ready to smash his head in without a second thought. But she never got that far. A white glove was left discarded on the floor. With only the slightest touch of the intruder's skin on her own, she was gone. Just remember, you made the first move. He cried. Midoriya stumbled backwards, his back pressed against the crate as his whole body trembled at the sight of what lay before him. The floor was red. It dripped from the ceiling. Blood. All that remained. Ah, oh, I'm filthy now. And it was all over him. That's why I hate the aftermath. No! Toga exclaimed, her mouth agape at the scene. Midoriya didn't know what to think as he saw the murder. So abrupt, so meaningless, right before his eyes. And then Compress jumped into action, desperate to use his quirk and imprison the attacker. But a golden bullet shot from a hole in the ceiling embedded itself in his arm. The arm itself was obliterated moments later. Toga pulled a knife from her sleeve. It was on impulse that Midoriya reached out and pulled it back. Shigaraki took her place, a deadly hand outstretched towards the stranger. There was another bullet, but this time it missed, 
Instead of the dangerous man turning to dust and crumbling pitifully to the floor, another appeared to step in between them, screaming in pain as he met his end. You should have just started with this! Shigaraki hissed as yet more villains burst through the wall. That was a close one overhaul, one exclaimed. Overhaul. That was his name. Midoriya felt his whole body shaking as he stepped back and slid down the crate once again, falling to the floor as he gripped the corners of the metal in a failing attempt to ground himself. A death on both sides, were the words from Overhaul's mouth that brought Midoriya back to reality. He had been staring at the red. Killing each other isn't productive. The League was yelling at each other now, all keen to fight back against the intruding group starting to back away. But their leader, Jigaraki, just stood there and stared. Overhaul hesitated at the door. Why don't we strike a deal? He said. You're crazier than me if you think we'll listen to you, Toga snarled. Midoriya didn't think he'd ever seen her act so serious. Overhaul let out another chuckle. Perhaps, but you might have noticed the apparent lack of your man's crook. What did you do? Compress barely managed, shaking in twice his arms as he barely acknowledged the loss of his own. One of Overhaul's men spoke up, holding a black pistol for all to see. Temporary cork eraser. Now we're sure they work. Thanks for your contribution. Here is my offer, Overhaul continued, rubbing the blood from his hands before covering them with the gloves he had previously discarded. Stick to your own ways to achieve your goals. I'll stay out of your hair. But if you want some of those bullets, a few every month perhaps, a sort of alliance. I owe your sad an arm after all. And in return, Shigaraki growled, still obviously unsure of what the Yakuza group really wanted. Canary. Shigaraki's red eyes met Midoriya's frightened green for a fraction of a second. As I said, I need money. No one will invest in a group who has yet to make a single dent in this world. If we turn up with him, well, they'll know we mean business. Midoriya pulled harshly at the cuff on his wrist. He wouldn't be a part of this. He refused. He didn't need his quirk to fight back. But Overhaul just huffed and turned away. Think about it, he said. Over his shoulder, he tossed a pristine white business card which slid across the floor to Shigaraki's feet. And call me. It finished as quickly as it had begun. Overhaul's gang walked away calmly like they had just been out for an evening stroll, despite what they had left in their wake. Combress was taken away by the others. He certainly needed medical attention. And so Midoriya was left behind, huddled up in the corner of the bedded warehouse. Stain dread. Toga was there too, sharpening her blades with a malicious look upon her face as she waited for Kirogiri to appear to take the two of them away to a safer location. Midoriya's trembling hand reached out for the radio. It was red too. Why was everything red? Static filled his ears for a moment as he carefully adjusted the crooked antenna. Our is fine, is true. Midoriya sighed when it cut to static again. He ignored the sticky red substance that stubbornly covered one side of the little device as he picked it up and hugged it against himself. The radio was all he had left. Eventually, the radio picked up signal again. I hear the whisper underneath your breath. Midoriya's own hitched. It wasn't the voice of just some random soul over the radio. I hear you whisper you have nothing left. He knew this voice. I will send out an army to find you. It was Jiro's. And suddenly he couldn't breathe. It's true, 
I will rescue you. Tears pricked at his eyes, the shock of the events that had just passed fading away as he really came to terms with what had just happened. I will never stop marching to reach you. He joked on the air at the thought of his friends, however far away they were waiting for him. It's true, I will rescue you. He took a deep breath as he heard Jiro do the same, inhaling the dust and musk through the corners of his mask and up his nose. Oh, I will rescue you. He heard Jiro back away from the microphone at the end of the song. It was distant, but still audible. Her stifled sob, that was. It was that noise that sparked a new light inside of Midoriya. He had to get out of here.